quote, you either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become a villain. Does this apply with educational mainstream content creation? Or is this why stylistic action esports and your Overwatch push out service level time? It's possible you can still attract some eyes. There's size of any that you're going to push out fan series. So where's the proof? All right, so let's, let's, let's actually listen to the uh, video here. Like Valorant and CSGO, it doesn't really have that. Why do Siege content creators avoid detailed competitive analysis in their content? This is a question that gets asked all the time. I'll tell you why. From my personal experience, it's because it doesn't do jack f shit for hits. This is why the Siege Year 6 roadmap looks the way it does. A border rework that I feel could have been overlooked since border was effectively written off by the competitive scene a long time ago. A favela rework that will see no competitive play. Some various map touch-ups that are kind of whatever in season 3. And an Outback rework, which I'm hoping works out, because that map is just awful and anything could be done to improve it. But there are maps in the current competitive pool that also see casual play. Like okay, so I guess we just continue to talk about Rainbow Six. Um, I mean, yeah, that's the, so. So basically, is it like is that? So I think it's a twofold problem because the problem is that yes, surface level Overwatch content gets way more views. Case in point, I hire Buff Hardtack to do YouTube shorts for me. And those videos have been probably the most popular uploads. I mean, they're not crazy. I don't have a huge YouTube following, but they've been the most popular YouTube videos I've uploaded in the last two weeks. Um, it's, it's, it appeals to a broader audience. Uh, and I think the length is another thing as well. Um, my YouTube in general has done better since I've started editing some of the, my videos and uploading them as 25 minutes or shorter. Um, People just don't have a lot of time or interest in watching a full VOD. Even if there is a beneficial uh, benefit to it, they want the 10 minute bites. They want the five minute bites, the 60 second humor. It's chewable, it's digestible, and appeals to a broader uh, thing here. So like the, the idea is that like people want to improve, but they don't want to be investing time into it. They want to laugh. They want to do this and that. So I don't think it's so much... Um, I don't think it's so much as like, oh yeah, humans suck. It just makes sense. It makes logical sense. Um, and this is why whenever I do, whenever I do a lot of content, I try and even on my like GM guides, I try and make it digestible and understandable for even a bronze. Like I, I believe Overwatch can be communicated if done well, so that even a lower rank player can have an idea of what's being explained, and it should be done succinctly whenever possible. I think an exception to that rule. At least the one exception that I've been given is the pro analysis. I do not want to try and edit a four hour pro analysis. Um, and I try and be very thorough with my pro analysis. Um, but even then, I personally have been questioning whether I should be trying to force myself to go faster with pro analysis or whether I should be more efficient with my pro analysis or whether I should be editing pro analysis. And I'm, and I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that question. So I know for my normal VOD reviews and my guides, I try and go as quickly as I can, as sufficiently as I can. And that just makes sense. But it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing. I will say this though, when he brings up Stylosa, Action Esports, and o your Overwatch, I don't think those guys get the pass for me. Because those guys, um, I mean, if anything, your Overwatch like, like bloats their videos, if anything. Um, but those guys, it's not so much that the content is too short and too casual focused. That's something that, by the way, can we stop saying that your Overwatch action stylus? I don't know about Silos. I've it's been a while since I've watched him. But can we stop saying a lot of these like these mediocre YouTube channels are casual focused? That's not always accurate. A lot of these channels are it's misinformation. It's not casual focused. It's just wrong. So saying that oh it's fine, you just it's not no no it's just wrong. It's just wrong. So. It's not that, oh, action esports are more casual. No, they're, they're, yes, but they're still wrong. So you can make a bronze guide or a basics of Sigma and not be wrong. And that's, 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 that's my beef, I guess, with some of these more well known game leap guides is not because that they're more casual focused. I get that. Even I, I'm trying to work on my casual uh, approachability, but they're just wrong. So I don't think that applies as much. Although you do see those channels psychologically feed into that mindset. Stylosis, clickbait titles, action esports, overly simplified, dumb, dumb down of concepts. And that's just why they often get them wrong. In your Overwatch clickbait, everything's about carry and pop off 
and easy to rank up. That's the that's the selling mindset because that's what gets the clicks, right? Um, the best video I've released in terms of like one of the better videos I've released in the last couple of months has been Elo Hell and How to Get Good at Overwatch. I think the Robin is attacking my window again. I might have to close the curtains, right? It's not been the it's it's been the clickbaity title ones which to be fair those videos were i think i did a pretty good job with those videos but it wasn't all the guides and this and that it was how to get good at overwatch and elo hell is real right <gasps> people click on that you know not only they click on it they watch it it is what it is you know all right um northwestern i think uh, let's say you have a brand new team of high diamonds and high masters, low GM players. Do you have a list of fundamental team skills or structures that you start when working with a new team? If so, what would it be? Is my team on so trying our target calls? No. No. Basic fight plans, mid fight action calls? Mm, maybe. I'm going to highlight this as suspect. Um. Mm, no they should they should already know this like if they're diamond whatever they should already know to scout so no here you go and we'll add here cam's gonna block you'll see it fight location slash positioning here, let me, let me let me scroll up. Let me scroll up then. <coughs> okay, so to be clear. Daxon, thanks for the sub. I appreciate it. Target calling. No. <clears throat> that is not a that is not a priority for team training. <clears throat> it's important it, it, it's it's way overblown in terms of team focus. Target priority is <clears throat> or target focus calls are helpful but not as important as like having a plan being in the right spot doing and shooting stuff at the same time positioning and timing right chat positioning timing and quality of plan that's overwatch uh mid fight action calls maybe as in kite or push that's pretty much it and that's very suspect right i i'm notorious for not spending a lot of effort in mid fight reviewing i prefer to figure out what was the f our fight plan between fights and what happened in the first five or six seconds of the fight most of the time info calls cooldowns positioning no overrated overrated people do that anyway uh even in bronze you know even in silver gold people know to call widow positioning or you know shoot you know ryan shield low like that that's not something that you have to teach um and then like i said adding the additional one here would be um Oops, fight locations slash positioning. Like where are we taking the fight? Where are we rotating to? Where are we going? That kind of stuff. So basic fight plans, <clears throat> fight locations, positioning. The only other thing I'd say as well is in like, uh, and then uh, like early fight action calls. I'm gonna use my mouse just to tilt you guys. Early fight action calls, like we go now. I'm Winston, I'm jumping in, I'm Ball, I'm, you know, I'm slamming, I'm rolling through, I'm Marissa, I'm planning a shield and halting. That's the key. So, basic fight planning and ult checking between fights. We talk about where we're setting up, and then where do we start. That's it. <sighs> nope, no different if it was a GM or a Diamond or Master team. Nope, same thing. The fundamentals of Overwatch are the same across the board. The only thing that might be a little bit more important in lower ranks is spending a little bit more time about basic positioning um, because that might be a little bit less intuitive because they have a little less experience. But a lower rank player uh, should be just as should be putting just as much effort into fight planning. A lower rank player should be putting just as much effort into ult checking. A lower rank player should be just as putting as just as much effort with basic communication of when we're starting our trade, whether that's going in or putting on a shield and shooting. Um, the only thing a low rank player will be worse at or should be worse at is uh, knowing where to position or where to rotate. That just comes to a lack of experience. What if your team is really bad at giving info calls? I mean, what info calls are they bad at? 
no nade, no monkey bubble, no Zarya bubbles. You kind of have to figure out like what info calls you guys are bad at, 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 at work tracking and then prioritize going over this. <clears throat> but I would not say just info calls across the board. I don't know if I do it in one-on-ones, but I, maybe I'd top bring it over. Maybe I'd have that as a scrim goal. I'm not sure. I've not had a lack of calling cooldowns be a major issue. Except for when we did Reaper Sombra, we would sometimes scout, like we try and t push a bubble advantage with Winston because we were very good at forcing Winston bubble in a really bad position. And we would try and call and push that. Um, also Arisa comps, we would uh, always track fortify advantage, right? And use that to push with our brig comps. <clears throat> but to be honest, Baggins, I've never worked with a team that was really bad at tracking key cooldowns. Um, I had some that needed to be better, but I didn't have anybody that was bad at it. So I'm unfortunately not experienced enough to answer that question. But I can tell you that it's probably something you could go over or touch on in team review about very important cooldowns. Right, silver saxophone. That 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 does that definitely needs to be addressed. A very specific map, specific question, excuse me, regarding Hollywood first defense. How important is the main high ground in front of choke? As a hit scan, as I always try to hold it first, but you get poked out due to lack of natural cover. Is it worth trying to hold? So we're gonna pull up Overwatch real fast. Real fast. Um I think it's not working. Give me a second chat. So the reason why Hollywood first high ground is really awkward is because oh, most of the time it's not super relevant early on but generally later on and the reason why that is <clears throat> is because most of the time it's used as a pop off or catch somebody with a pants on position and not as a I start here I hold here I continue to play here the reason for that is, is because most of the time in Hollywood first, the fights actually don't break out above or below the high ground. They actually break out around the corner. Now, this is a rank specific advice. <clears throat> so take what I say with a grain of salt. Because if you're playing in bronze, I don't know where they hold in bronze. They might hold very, very far forward or on the very first choke. But most teams probably around gold or plat are going to start holding. Here. This is the kill box right here, right? Or right here. In which case the high ground is too far forward. You're in front of your team if you're on the high ground. You kind of see the problem here? So teams will, you can start here as hit scan because you're getting a little bit early poke. You know, your tanks are up here maybe, right? But as your team backs off, you should also back off and play a high ground that's around the kill box, right? Or you could let the enemy team, you can back off to here. Enemy team pushes off. This positioning is terrible, terrible sight lines and push off late. And then now, you're on a hard flank, right? You're on a flank on this kill box, which is where your team is looking to fight around anyway. So the problem you might be having with high ground is that you need to be paying attention to where your tanks are set up. If your tanks are backing off, as most tanks will, from here to here, you are no longer on a good off angle. You are pushed in front of the enemy team, in front of your team, where you either want to back off or let the enemy team push so they turn their back on you and then peek out and get kills from here. You can ask your man to, up, to be up there, but he can't hold there forever because it's not good cover. It could be handy to go up there as Arya's George. There are chairs there? I mean, I guess so. Okay, chat, am I the only finds this satisfying? Roll, 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 roll. Uh, yeah. Move, you stupid piece of orange crap. Uh. Okay, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, please. Please, 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 please. Ah, yes. Okay, but yeah, I hope that answers that question. You're watching a Sleepy stream? Please do not compare me to Sleepy ever again. Uh, I I watch Noob Hunter occasionally. My wife and I will be like, we got like 10 minutes while I'm eating. I'm just like, ah, just pull up. It'd be kind of funny. And every single time, unsalted salt, the raging, I'm going to swear and say a bunch of profane things, and that's humor. Or Sleepy comes on. I just want to like, I just want I want to weep. Like how, what, why do people enjoy this? Sleepy and unsalted salt make me mold. 
<clears throat> As on on first point, Havana defense, where do you play? I find it very hard to find a good spot because if you play far back, the boss will block your line of sight. If you fly close, you will get run over. If you play the right stairs, you're between the snipers. Okay, well, <laughs> I should have closed down Overwatch. <laughs> Let me get this pulled up again. Can I review your new punter clip? No, <laughs> not reviewing your new punter clip. Screw you, kid. <laughs> so Ana first is a little awkward for Ana, for sure. And to get it, like Hollywood, it really does depend where your team is set up. Um, let me get this set up. But I can understand your your, your difficulty here. Um, why is it Juice Day? I have no idea. Juice is something that big, funny, popular streamers say, so I said it too. <clears throat> Never to <clears throat> Hang on, kitty. Um, so for for me, it's on a, I might start like here, right? Play here, you know, heal, 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 pop for nade, pop for nade. But I'd probably end up transitioning to here. Because you're right, the snipers are a problem. You obviously have to worry about this grappling position up here. Um, but and then, but you can swing here, you can go here, you can like go for a nade, like you know, like here, but this is probably your best position. And then if the cart moves, you can move back here or you can move back here, right? And kite up here, <clears throat> right? Those are your best options. They're not great, but they work. Midget is a bad influence. Did I, I said popular streamers. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna leave this game. I'm gonna keep Overwatch up just in case. <clears throat> Echo annihilates Diva, and Diva is a common in Metacom. So is Echo just bad versus Bap versus McCree? The problem with Echo is that she's bad versus Bap and McCree, and she's also bad versus Bap and McCree and Diva. So there's three different things. Like Diva by herself would get melted, but if Diva has the support of a hit scan, it's just another hero that can chase down a Diva. Um, and Echo can't not be played in Brawl because she can't offingle very well with Bap Lucio supports. So for to play an Echo <clears throat> in a rush comp, you would have to play like Zen Lucio or something and just so hope that your Ryan never needs healing or Brig Lucio and hope that your Brig never gets run over, which would just be trash because Echo needs constant range support and Bap and Lucio can't heal an Echo unless she sits inside of her team. And if she sits inside of her team, she's not very good, right? There's other heroes that are better at that. Um, <clears throat> um that's that's the big reason it's because echo has to split but to split she demands a range support and she can't get range support and in terms of not playing in terms of not playing the mirror in terms of just playing normal spam versus uh dive normal spam is still okay like ball comps and ball echo is still okay but echo isn't very good against creep app and diva basically tldr and even a may like even a may can be a little annoying to deal with as echo so Echo is still a strong hero. She's just not very favored in the meta right now. <clears throat> Could you explain what playing resource light or playing these means and how can I risk apply in ring game games? Um, basically, the idea is that if you're uh, on an angle or on a position and you're uh, basically 1v3ing or 1v2ing, you're probably not going to win that 1v2, but you're still getting value. You know, If your timing is right, you're still getting value by existing on that angle and flank at the same time pressuring the enemy team right so the idea is that okay my team is taking a five versus four as long as i can keep these two gentlemen or these two ladies uh busy but i obviously understand that it's a two versus one so i'm not going to win this two versus one i just need to survive this two versus one whoops um so that our team is able to win the resource trade as in move my camera or what Probably move my camera, but I'm too stupid to, to recognize that. <laughs> I said I move my thing. Uh, uh. You meant like move my chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I would do that, Neapolitan, but I don't care about you or what you think, so I'm not going to. So resource lie is basically understanding that you're at a disadvantage, but that your team is fighting at the same time as you are, 
and that they will have an advantage elsewhere. So you just need to survive that. If you're playing Tracer and you're play, you've got the Bap Zin both focusing you down, you're probably not going to kill both, but it's a 2v1. So as long as you survive and bait their attention for a period of time, their team's not getting any healing. Be nice. Okay, okay. The fact that you have to cash in to be nice is like having to pay your mother to kiss you, which you probably are very well experienced with. Be nice. At least you have a mother, right? Your mother your mother probably loves you. I, I'm probably treading in dangerous ground here. One of these days, someone's going to be like, my mom's dead, or like, you know, my mom's not doing so well, or I haven't spoken to my mother in years, and I'm just going to feel really stupid. Okay. Um... Hopefully it's not you. You do? Okay, good. Hopefully she likes you. Hopefully she likes you. Good. All right, see, there you go. <laughs> That's my being nice. All right, can you do a review of the Collegiate Grand Finals? It's on the Contenders YouTube channel. <laughs> Probably not. Not with Overwatch League coming up as soon as it is. Probably not. There's going to be so much pro content coming up soon. Um, I'm probably going to be doing my scouting reports on stream. So probably not, sadly. But we've done a lot of pro analysis recently. I'm going to take a little break before the Overwatch League craziness starts. Um, and what was in the Diva Lucio Synergy and Reval? I By the Diva Lucio Synergy, I assume that you mean the assassinations. I didn't watch the Collegiate, but a big thing that... Uh, uh, brawl mirrors can play around is especially in maps where diva lucios can get good positions uh and closer range maps they can do a lot of bap slash mccree assassinations because if bap gets too far split uh too far back or doesn't have shift or lamp you can int the bap and kill the bap um if the Cree get is on an angle but he's too isolated you can int and kill the mccree um so i assume that's something that you look for the diva lucio synergy is probably a big part of that um but that is something that you can look for so i'll comment on what you're talking about but i'm not i don't have time to go over it as much yeah, that being said, Anima, you know, Collegiate is really getting up there, man. Like, cre credit like to Collegiate. Collegiate is the future, I think, of Overwatch. Even if Overwatch League does that, Collegiate will probably still be around. How do I use Diva Bomb and get literally any value out of it? Aggress and then remech. Aggress and then remech. And make sure that you're in a position to remech. Or make sure that you're timing your Diva Bombs when the enemy team is in a position to be pushed on, split, and or whatever. I think one of the ways you can look at Diva Bomb is you can use Diva Bomb like High Noon very passively and cautiously with your cover early in the fight or aggressively mid-fight. And in the Devolve fight, you'll probably get a kill. You can also just aggress with it and use it as uh, a second life. But again, you need a position to remake. What is the best Jelly Belly player? Uh, I don't know. It's been a long time since I've had Jelly Beans. I like the fruitier ones, like watermelon and, and like pineapple and stuff. Like the more like eclectic fruit ones, not like cherry and, but like peach and watermelon and stuff like that. I, I like I like those flavors. Just in general, I like those flavors. Like jelly, jelly beans or not. How do I win in the sim jung bronk mirror? Bronk mirror. I run into Ling Zhang off, and my team struggles to win that specific mirror. Um, you need to make sure that your junk rat is taking off angles uh, on the control center, like he's trying to control white. Um, uh, you need to make sure that you are synchronizing your pressure very well um, and that you're holding space. So a lot of like make sure that you're not greeting lamp, that you're using lamp to just quickly get control of white room and then you're splitting your junk slightly on off angles. That's the that's the that's extremely basic way of describing it. But like make sure that you have a junk on an off angle on a short sideline because Junkrat is like the biggest pick hero in that comp. He gets the most random picks more so than any other hero by far. Okay. Um, what should I be doing as D.Va to get more value than Zarya, assuming we have both the same mechanics? Offing will utilize high ground. Your team commits, you utilize high ground. My tactic cat just turned on the air purifier. Hang on. <clears throat> Give me one second, chat. I'm going to pause real quick to feed my cat. Do you want to eat? Eat, good girl. Come eat. But yeah, just, just when your team does commit, or even before your team commits, if as long as you're playing around where your team is positioned, you realize a high ground, a little split here and there. Uh, the timing is crucial because you can get melted if you're too early or too aggressive, but yeah. Do you think you're a bad influence? I mean, you're not even an influence. <laughs> like, a bad influence implies that you have some influence over people. You're, you're about as influential as a roach. Um, probably smell about the same too. Um... <clears throat> 
Uh, how do you, in scrims mainly, as a team captain and main tank, stop pressuring yourself so much and putting all the fun on yourself? If I do a fight plan, we lose the map or multiple maps, lose the camera, put a blame on me, is he aiming myself, you harder than quality, how am I on my vet? Okay. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. You, the goal should never be to win a scrim block, first off, and you, and you should know that. But the idea is that you, yeah, you need to, okay, you need to go into a scrimmage with a goal. Okay, so I play flag football, right? And even when we're playing official games or just pickup games, I'm, my goal is either to just have fun and see what happens, or I'm going in to work on a specific coverage or focusing on pulling the flag or running good routes or running really fast or having really good jukes. Um, so speed is my big advantage, uh, speed, and I have really good hands. So I try and like work on things around that, like improve my aspects and different things like that. Uh, if, so if you're going to a scrimmage and you're just kind of like, you're, you're focusing on if the fight plan goes wrong, things like that, are you actively working on improving the quality of your fight plan? If you are, and you're losing the map and you lose the scrim, you're, the goal shouldn't be, ah, rah, rah. the goal should be, ah, crud. All right, you know what? I'm, as soon as this, uh, you know what? Let's just finish out the scrim, go next. As soon as the scrim's done, I'm gonna go back and look at the replay and look at the VOD and see like if I could have fight plan, like if the fight plan was the problem there, like what could I have done better there? Like you have, you cannot be emotional about this stuff. Like I know I'm just, I know it's so easy for me to say, but the goal is to avoid being emotional about this stuff. The goal is to be impartial, to be literally an observer. I think the best way to describe it is just observer of your own gameplay and not an emo just a critic, right? You're vodering yourself. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That that Reinhardt, he probably should not have called for us to engage with beat when they had a uh, mail like that because it's too easy for them to, them to kite and then we get put in a really bad position. Yeah. Okay. So that Reinhardt needs to work on that, right? That's kind of how you psychologically look at it. Um, and if you're not like actively working on your, uh, your 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 fight planning, then you need to be working on something. Going in and trying to win scrim blocks. Like the look at the look at the terminology you're using here. Uh, going out, I do and we lose the map, we lose the scrim, put all the blame on me. It makes me angry at myself. Oh, it harms the quality, affects my team, pressuring myself. No, go train, practice, and have goals besides the winning and the losing and this and that, right? And even if and even if the goal is to make a fight plan so that you win the fight, if you don't win the fight, then you need to find out what you can do to better fight plan. Not what you can do to win more maps. What's my 40 time? I actually don't know. I've never done a 40 time, but I am pretty fast. I'm pretty fast. I've always been the fastest player in my team in any sport I've played. Through high school and college and stuff. Yeah, the entire connotation of the message is negative. Which is fine. That's what he's trying to solve, or she's trying to solve. But the goal is to, to take that and be constructive with it, not destructive. Do something with it. Horton P, thank you for the sub. Appreciate it. How do you feel raw skill? Carry players or higher star players matches up versus overall teamwork. Um, if the raw skill, because here's the thing. We've seen teams like American Tornado that just have a lot of raw skill, but they also are just super comfortable just calling plays and just trolling and having a good time. And the funny thing is, is that is an aspect of teamwork. Just everybody calling and just having a good time and listening to each other and trusting each other. Like you guys saw the player led video. If you haven't, you need to check it out. Uh, player led teams video, excuse me. And so the the funny thing is that raw skill sometimes translates to teamwork. Not, I wouldn't say accidentally, but just kind of like it, it just happens to work out like that, right? But I have also known a lot of teams that have a lot of raw skill, but there's no leadership. They're not good comers. They have bad attitudes and they go. Pfft. In fact, there's a team in content western contenders that currently is massively underperforming slash tanking because of that very same issue and i won't say who um skilled players but just massively underperforming because their communication slash leadership slash planning is just dog um so i think versus overall teamwork teamwork is the most important thing, but people have to understand that teamwork isn't just having a perfectly structured comm structure and perfect ult tracking, and they know every rotation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Teamwork can just be guys. Listen, go in there and have fun. Focus and have fun, and uh, and and pipe up, you know. And there and there, that's half a teamwork right there, man. That's half your teamwork right there.
you know so sometimes it just it just works better for teams do you think a team like Justice with Assassin Decay might be more dangerous than a team like, say, better coaching but less star power? They can be if they hit on the concepts that are important. If they have the good leadership, if they have the good synergy, the good communication, and, they're, and, they're, and they enjoy being around each other, then yes, this team can absolutely be better than a more regimented structure coach uh, situation. Um, I think one of the things that just once again confirmed my opinion about coaching, at least in the Overwatch League, is did any of you guys read Zeroid's interview with FD God? The French, they translated it from French to English. Did any of you guys read that? Did you read what F, how FD God described Co uh, Krusty's coaching style? Krusty, you know, big, mean, mega man, mastermind, tough on you, crack of the whip, taskmaster Krusty. Did any of you guys hear what they said about Krusty? Uh, good, you're welcome, Dart. No. Krusty is like a buddy. He's like actually doesn't even yell that much. He yells some, but he's like actually nice and like he's really close to his players and he has a good time with them. Yeah, he's not the taskmaster as much as people think he is. It's much more relaxed. People work hard and train hard and he's probably tough when he needs to be tough, but it's a lot more relaxed than people think. I'm telling you. It's not an accident that that's what uh that that's what leads to success a lot of the time, you know. I mean, you guys look at me and how angry I am. Oh man, I'd hate to play for Spilo, dude. I'm a nice. I'm I'm way nicer than you guys know. And when I'm team coaching, I'm I'm not at all like I am on stream. I'm a little bit. I definitely yell and I slam my desk sometimes, sometimes. But and that and that never ever happens until I've earned a player's trust or team's trust. Never. And that's always just to affirm a point or to get their attention. That's never to berate or belittle or insult or criticize. Never, never, not once. Alex, very mean coach. Shut up, Alex. See? <laughs> I'm telling you, coach, coaching should not be like that. You, if you, I mean, I'm, I'm, like the greatest coach that I had in high school was a very big, loud, tough guy, but he was the most considerate coach and he cared so much for his players and that was m way more to me <sighs> i would love to play for me as well i mean i mean maybe i mean there's there's a lot of it, like a lot of it just depends on like if you get away with it or if it works well for you but yeah you know. if i request a non-insult review will he be coached better by you maybe 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 not because part of it is for stream, but part of it's also because sometimes people just remember things better that way. And if you know you're signing up for a roast review, you're prepared for it, so you don't get your feelings hurt. And because you don't get your feelings hurt, you're more willing to listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> Alex tells the truth. Yeah. Hard cap. <laughs> Best hero to learn. Oh, fitness videos win. I, I don't know. I thought about it, but we'll see. We'll see. I still feel like I have too much. I have a good, solid fundamentals of fitness and like health, but I'm not like an expert in it. So I, I, I'm not as comfortable with it as I'm with like my Overwatch game knowledge. Best hero to learn in Silver Gold to improve the game fast free troll for a relatively new player. I would try every, if you're, well, I would make sure that you have two or three hours in every single hero and, or maybe more, three or four, maybe four or five. In every single hero, if, if possible. I mean, if you pick up a hero and you're like, this hero is awful. I never want to play this hero again. Okay, probably don't need to play a lot of that. Try get put in a solid amount of time with each and every hero, and then find a couple that are, you know, both DPS, both tank, makes both sport and play from there. You should try and play a little of every hero to try and figure out like what you enjoy the most. Um oh I'm 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 sorry, Baggins, I, I missed you. Somehow I see blue and it just kind of all blended together. How did you go about preparing for a VOD review and then enforcing it in scrims? Uh, I've gotten feedback from players and this is the main complaint. Reviews are not as focused on a singular idea and scrims are unfocused. So we've talked about this. We, we, we went over this in your review of a review, right? How you need to focus up, simplify the concept or goal with the review. And then you need to take that into a scrim and every single map go, all right, guys, remember what we talked about. How is that going to apply here? What are we going to be doing that here? And get that conversation started. I have limited time to prepare stuff due to classwork, but I want to prove the quality of what I can provide your place. Well, then there you go. Um, you know, simplify your reviews, 
focus your reviews and then go into scrims and just be a reminder. I don't, sometimes I talk a lot in scrims, sometimes. In fact, I probably talked too much in scrims. Um, but when I was coaching properly, like perfectly, I didn't talk all that much in scrims. I, I, it was better when I was talking less. I needed to get other people to talk. Cause like if we lose a map and guys are talking about like what went wrong and what needs to happen next map and like what adjustments that needs to be made. And that happens right up until the next map starts. Then I don't need to say anything. As long as we're focused and we, and we're talking about what needs to be done next map, then I don't need to say anything. What I need to do is if there was if there was something important that we missed or something that we need to do focus on for next map or you know we're getting a little distracted and, and way too goofy a little bit of fun is totally fine um, then that that's that's kind of when I speaked up but most of the time like I remember back when I first started coaching I would have a lot of feedback talking about like what went wrong last map like remember this map we got to worry on this rotation and that rotation and remember this and this and remember this and this and I just do blah 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 blah. blah. As, avoid that as much as you can. I know some coaches that just kind of don't say anything the entire scrim, and I think that's bad. Um, but the goal is to try and say as little as you can. But but to but to remind players of what they need to focus on, or you know, around the review. And even if you don't have a review, like if we didn't review today, we didn't have time, you know, or like or it was you know we reviewed yesterday. Just have something that you're gonna like basic and simple. Maybe having to do with the review that you guys are focusing on for this week or whatever to remind them and f you know get them talking about it and, and and ask questions too. That's another thing. It's like don't be like, all right, guys, remember shot call. Remember we're calling plans. Be like, all right, guys, we gotta call plans here. Like, what is remember, remember every single time? Like, where well, where do you think we're gonna rotate? You know, where do you think like what do you think the enemy comp is gonna play? Like, what are, how are we gonna beat the enemy composition? Like, what do you need that kind of thing? Like, get get conversation started. Easier said than done. Mid fight scrimmaging, uh, scrim, mid mid scrim feedback is very hard. It's very basic, but it's very hard. Hey, very Tory. God help me. Uh, what's the best way to get out of the mental boom for dropping 100 SR in a day? I mean, <laughs> at some point you have to understand that dropping SR in a day is normal. I have dropped. 500 SR before over the course of like three or four days and I dropped 300 SR or no yeah 300 SR, almost 300 SR in one day before it happens to everybody bad luck and we talked about the elo hell video right where you, you know you you get mental boomed and you actually start playing worse 100 SR is legit nothing I don't even play the game and I've dropped 150 SR in a day all right like I've, I've played I've played like uh, yeah so Right, so so yeah, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. The, the best way to get on the mental boom is go take a walk, drink some water, finish for the day, be done for the day, you know, or take a walk, feel a little better, go try it again. It's not, it's not, trust me, it's not, it's not, it's not. So it, it feels overwhelming now, but I want you to think of it as like, and I'm not saying this to be condescending. But do you remember how, like, when you were a teenager, you know, you had a bad hair day and it felt like the end of the world? And you get to, like, you're an adult, you're like, man, what was I thinking? It's not the poo-poo that, right? That feeling is real. The disappointment and fear and frustration and, you know, being self-conscious about it is real. But knowing that you, at some point in time, are going to look back and go, it wasn't that big of a deal. Knowing that at some point, when you get more experience, you'll understand it's not as big of a deal. That should that should encourage you. Hey, listen, I may not I may feel overwhelming now, but I know that it's really not that big of a deal. You still are. Oh, well. You gave the impression of being a really, really, really old man. Um, I see Connor's question here, and I'm just gonna ignore it for right now. Uh, what type of player benefits the most from coaching? Um, the player that's most willing to like take the coaching and apply it really, really, really hard. But also the player that takes like the the, the for example, I coached Backbone and Grayson, who I feel like I got got the most benefit out of my coaching last season, and and actually to an extent shade towards the end of the season as well. And what I did with them is I didn't even give them a lot of like insight. I, I mean, I did. I, I, I gave them a, not. I didn't give them a lot of insight. I gave them a decent amount of insight. Like we talked about how to play their hero better, how to do their cooldowns better, how to play the composition. But the biggest impact I had was with 
those players that actually they took it and they really applied it on their own. In other words, when I coached Backbone, it wasn't like a micromanaging Backbone. I would stay on Backbone and then Backbone would actually take the initiative himself. The best players to coach aren't the yes men, not at all. They're the people that listen to your feedback and maybe disagree or debate, but really hustle and are encouraged and motivated and go and take responsibility on themselves. Shade, uh, the last month I coached in November, was it November? Yeah, uh, I wasn't with him with Gauntlet. We talked about his leadership and communicating pushes and, and being an alpha, and that was and, and he just he just hard cared. I mean, really, everybody on that team stepped up that month, but Shade in particular really stepped up that month. And it wasn't even like macro, micro, Arisa details. It was just Shade, me staying on his butt and saying, "You have to lead this team this month," and he did. And that was the coaching that he benefited the most from. It wasn't, yes, sir, I will do that. It was him really taking what I gave him and, and going above and beyond. So the best, yeah. Shade, Shade finished with a platinum medal. Um, and and to a lesser extent, you as well, Alex. Like Alex, Alex was never, you know, a yes man. He's a very intelligent player. And there are some things that he agreed with and, and he received critique very well. Um, but he also, you know, he, he had his own opinions about things and we discussed and we debated things. But like players need to not just take, listen, or not just, okay, I agree with you, but they actually actually need to take it and apply it and, and work on it and figure it out. Like, I don't know, like I, I see, just saying yes, sir, and doing it isn't good enough. It just isn't. Shade ended as a plat player. <laughs> I mean, no, that's not shoot. I was like, what? Oh yeah, I miss Shade so much. I miss Shade. Shade was a Shade was a real brother. Uh, specifically on Li Shang Tower Night Market, how should a team deal with the other team teleporting into a point as a ball comes in and on the entrance? You have to take angles. You can't rush the touch. So the thing with the Night Market TP strat, the reason why it's slightly less popular than the uh, Garden strat. Wait, I'm sorry. I thought you said Garden. Night Market. You have to take angles. Uh, you can run pharmacy there. Uh, you can spam from both doors and try and peek and break the turrets and eventually touch in a point, or you can mirror sim. There's a reason why sim may is really strong there, though, or it's really popular. It's because it's really strong. Um, so it's not just, oh, just take angles, guys. Like, take angles, but good luck. It's rough. You know, pharmacy is the easiest way of countering it, but it it it's not, you need a good far, and obviously it's not 100% guaranteed, because you might win, but it's going to take some time. Yeah. But I mean, Connor will back me up with the whole shade and, and like backbone and uh, Grayson thing. Like I felt like a lot of our coaching wasn't even like a ton of micro little details. It was like giving them basics and then just kicking them in the butt and making them like actually coach themselves and like actually motivate themselves. Um, how resistant should I be flexing and ranked as main tank if I only care about improving my main tank? You should be very, very, very resistant. <laughs> you should be very resistant. I mean, it depends on how flexible you are. If you're a Ryan OTP, that, <laughs> that might be a problem. But if you're playing, hey, I play Ryan Ball and Winston, you should be fine. Like, you, you there's there's not going to be a comp that you can't play Ryan Ball and Winston in. Like, I just can't. So I have the same playtime and Tracer, my alt, my main, and my alt, my winner is A Winston, my main is 24%, which is the reason why my alt is also like 100% SR higher. I mean, <laughs> Here. Let me let me circle the problem here, okay. Besides the mental of oh I'm playing in my alt, so I'm less concerned, so I'm playing less stressed, and so I'm playing better. When you're when you're less concerned about winning and losing, you're gonna end up playing better a lot of the time. So there's that pressure here. But also I want to highlight something here. Two hours. <laughs> that's not many games. <laughs> that's not many games at all. So you are not a statistical anomaly until that adds, you know, a zero until the end of that. Then we can talk. Um, at which point you'll probably be a new rank. Uh, hang on. This is so... I forget that Overwatch just really hates Epic Ben. Sorry, give me a second, chat. Okay. Um, when I'm playing... My mind is either completely idle or I feel like a mastermind. There's no in between, so I'm not very consistent. Is it just playing more the only way to improve my gains? Is there something I can be doing? I'm um, playing more for sure, but also you could do like this little ways of hacking it. Like you could, you could have a little timer that goes off every five minutes to encourage you to be more like aware and focused. Not like, but like a little ding, you know, ding, you can get them on your phone, right? Um, 
you can go into like you get for, for example you sit down to play and you're like oh holy cow i'm autopiloting so hard okay i really need to focus listen just for the first one or two team fights i mean i know i'm autopiloting here i'm out of my brain but i'm gonna make myself focus as hard as i can for the first two team fights and work on that um there's something to be said for that but i'd also recommend making sure that you're entering every game session in the same mindset with the same health situations in other words make sure that you're not sleeping more in one day and less in the next that you're eating different that you're playing early in the morning and late at night be consistent with your training schedule you'll be more consistent with your training that being said nobody's ever perfectly consistent these are just things that will help it won't fix it nobody can fix this <laughs> unfortunately we're not robots um uh, would you say that the method worked with lowering players? Which method? I'm, I'm sorry, I lagged a little behind. Hi, <laughs> Pelix. We have ever make an Ash guy with the Keanu Middleton clue. Asking the wrong. Okay. Angles. Dynamite timing. Uh, either before, directly before, or direct, really right, right as they push, or right after they push. So a lot of the thing with dynamite is that you have to understand that, like when we talk about timing with dynamite, the optimal time to dynamite is right as the enemy team pushes, or right as your team pushes. But the unfortunate part of the matter is that oftentimes you won't have an angle set up that you will be able to land a big fat juicy dynamite that early. Also. There's going to be more things like shield, matrix, bubbles, things are going to get in your way. So generally, the most valuable dynamites consistently are going to be immediately after uh, the fight starts. So like the fight will start, dynamite, right? Right as the shields are down, a little lower, you get more space to take an angle. The enemy team is aggressing into your own angle, things like that. Um, angle's a big one. Uh, high ground is obviously pretty good for Ash. Um, Bob and an off angle, like there's just no, like Bob is such a free fight win in so many ranks if you just position it properly, like on an off angle shooting backline when they commit or when your team commits on an off angle on backline. I see so many ashes, Bob, in a tiny little alcove where they can easily hide from it or frontline shooting shield or on payload. It makes me want to like, it's awful. Please don't do that as Ash ever, like almost ever, unless you need to like to touch point or something like that. And even then you try an off angle on point. It just, it, it bothers me to no end. So um, angles, dynamite timing, the thing, like you said about range, um, the Bob and the off angle, don't save Bob, use Bob. As soon as a fight, team fight starts, um, um, Maybe other little thing would be like making sure that you're in, entering each fight as close to full ammo as possible. That sometimes, you know, with Ash, with it is as it is with really ranged heroes, you do have a little bit of a poke stage before the fight starts if you're playing very conservative, but it's important that you're entering the actual fight fight with as much ammo as possible. Cheers, Henry. That's a tough question though. Just, I'm gonna be perfectly honest. That is a endless struggle. So good luck. I would also look for outside resources from people smarter than me that comes uh, that might be able to help you with that. Use machine back when back inside. Honestly, think it could help with lower rank players. Lower rank players are not helpless little idiots. They're helpless little idiots when it comes to Overwatch, but they're not helpless little idiots when it comes to understanding life and getting better at stuff. You know, some of the best coaching that I ever received when I was improving on new skills was very, very hands off. You need to practice this. Good luck. Go rep it. Go take some responsibility. Go rep it. And I figured a lot of stuff out on my own. But yeah, I don't think that it's any different with low-ring players. I think it's easier with low-ring players to be more heavy-handed, but that's not necessarily better. Um, I mean, again, like just like how, like how a baby learns how to walk, right? Learns how to walk with very minimal coaching. You think Baba on point is good against an Ana? I mean, obviously not as good, but it's still, it's still, uh, it still does stuff. It's still capping point. Any tips to get over nerves when screaming for one for hundreds of hours, still get nerves before you scream and aim. Okay. Ah, uh, boy. Um, if you've been screaming for hundreds of hours and still haven't gotten better, I would ask you make sure that you have a pre scrim ritual. That would be one thing to help. So go into the training range and you have to hit 200 headshots or something like that, or go into aim arena, or uh, you get up and you have to do 25 push-ups before the scrim starts, like directly before. 
have a pre-scrim ritual, that's not easy. That takes focus. Like that actually takes intense focus to take your mind off of yourself. You want to get out of your mind and into focusing on something else instead. Um, and then once the scrim starts, uh, that will take some of the edge off of it. Like once you're in, and obviously the nerves probably will come in, but that will give you something that there's less time sitting there dawdling, you know, <laughs> right? Um, uh, and then I would recommend looking up the competitive advantage mental coaching on YouTube. And he'll have some videos to help you. That's the simplest answer I have for you. Sure, pineapple bro, sure. Is McCree better in most situations to play than Ash? Um, I mean, right now, because he's just slightly stronger in the meta, but uh, depends very much on the map. Is your Discord tag Spilo's hashtag 442 because you're 42 years old? Okay. <laughs> I was tempted. Um... Would I consider repping aim labs as one of those rituals? Sure. Anything that anything that takes your focus and intention and effort. Don't just do like, I just sit in practice range and kill bots because that takes no effort whatsoever. You need something that actually takes effort. Uh, okay, Boomer. Uh, yeah. You're welcome. Do you think Overwatch has different types of players the same way that fighting games do? How would you categorize them? Mind the player whose primary strength comes from leveraging information about the game from frame data to options, like the player whose primary strength comes from typing the count of the other Um, I think there, when it comes to like organized team play, you can have um, the heart for sure, the the voice, right? The voice, the leader. You can have the brain, which would be somebody who is more methodical and thoughtful. Uh, and then you can just have the mechanical pop-off player, right? The player that's maybe the mechanical, uh, like who doesn't talk a lot, doesn't lead a lot, but is just very mechanically talented. With my most recent team, Sheer Cold, the heart, the soul, a lot of times was backbone, refuge, shade, depending on the situation, sometimes Graythen. The mind was certainly um, Alex. Uh, a lot of the time consistently, like a very, very intelligent player. And the aim was a lot of times looser. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's there's certain archetypes. I mean, obviously you would like everybody to be consistent at communicating and everybody who's mechanically strong, um, but there's certainly people who are bring value in other ways. <clears throat> Is there any advice to not be so hard on yourself, not the feeling of will I ever get better at this game than I am right now? Tell us about this. Yes, the game. Um, hey, Lakshmi. Started playing seriously again lately and got five senior from Masters. <laughs> now I'm back to three thousand one hundred. To, to be honest. I don't know how much how MMR works, but it's probably because you took such a long break from Overwatch and now that you're playing again, and yeah. I mean, there's no way that you take that long of a break and then you're still masters, but uh, congratulations on staying diamond and thank you for the sub, mate. Good to see you. It's been a long time. Uh, competitive advantage, Andrew. Competitive advantage. It's an old old white dude. He's a, He knows his stuff. He's really good. I recommend that. Competitive advantage, mental coaching. If you can't find it, let me know. Uh, I got a question. Oh boy. Um, is, is there any advice to not be so hard on yourself and not get this feeling of, will I ever get better than I am right now? I feel as if I was progressively getting much better in scrims and recently I've been playing really bad and can't recover. So a lot of it just like demands a mental reset. And the best way to like kind of get yourself a mental reset is number one, is just be like, you know what? I'm getting worse or I'm not getting better. It happens, sucks, unlucky. Give yourself something, don't like... <laughs> Like better at what? What are you failing at get better at? What's not getting better? Scoob, what? Like, what are you not getting better at? Cause I have this feeling as well. Cause like sometimes I'll be practicing something and I feel like I can't get any better at it. But then I'm like, am I just trying to get in better in general? Or there's just something very specific that you need to be trying to get better at. Cause like, I think one of the best ways to kind of shift your focus away from this general feeling of mediocrity is to be like, you know what? I'm really going to work on my old placement or really like, I mean, that's something we talk about all the time is like we, we give specific feedback, specific advice that you can actively control, right? Because you can control how you position yourself. You can control how you use your cool lens. You can't control if you hit your shots. You can't control if you play as a whole better necessarily. 
Just this is what I'm working at. This is what I'm getting better at. That's it. That's it. If you're getting progressively much better, Instagram is what you say I've been playing really bad and can't recover. Well, probably because first off, you're sitting there feeling bad for yourself. And that's not helping. And second off, because instead of, oh, I'm playing really bad, what do I need to be doing to fixing this? What you're probably just continuing to dwell on feeling bad, feeling bad, feeling bad, feeling bad, feeling bad. You need to you need to actively say, okay, I'm playing really bad. What 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 needs to change? What needs to be fixed? What is what am I failing at? That's the problem. And and fix that. That's what needs to change. Be specific. Be specific. Your success should not be, for example, if I'm 350, 400 pounds overweight, it's not about being skinny. It's about being able to do 20 jumping jacks in a row. Or it's about eating one less candy bar or like 50 less calories a day. That's the goal. Not to get for not to be skinny, not to be better, not to be, not to be better, excuse me, not to be, you know, not, to, not even to be better, really. The goal shouldn't even necessarily be skinnier. It should be to be doing, to do, my goal is to do this every single day and the better will come as a result. You get better because you're doing the individual things better and you're practicing those individual things. So in League of Legends, there are video timers that ding every few seconds to remind you to check your minimap. Is there something someone watching you can check? Not really. I talked about this with the phone thing earlier. I had a timer that I used to use for my neck, my posture. You probably get that with a phone. Yeah. One step at a time. Like, like, what's going to make you better? Right? What's going to make you better? Positioning, timing, ultimate, game sense, mechanics. And what are you going to do to get, what are you going to do to get better at those? Not what are you going to do to get better, but what are you going to do to get better at those? Uh, um, so, uh, is there a, cons okay, I guess this is it. We're going to do the last few questions. Is there a consistent way to practice and improve aim and junk rat? Yes. I mean, Concussive mine, direct plus concussive mine is how you kill Farah. And a way to practice and improve aim on Junkrat is a way to practice and improve aim on Junkrat with any, like any hero. Aim Arena, I don't know if you can play Junkrat Aim Arena, but Aim Arena, deathmatch. Calm. That's it. No, there's no nothing different with Junkrat with any other hero. When are you going to add more tiers at hammer time? Um, yeah, I probably should. I, I, I need to do it. Here's the thing is like, there's a lot of little things that I need to do with stream and stuff, but right now there's a lot of stuff that I'm, I'm working on right now. Like there's like, like inside and outside of Overwatch. So it's a little hard for me to try and like prioritize because it's like life. Like I have to prioritize. For me, it's like adding another Hammer Time tier is something I want. I think it would add quality to stream because there's a lot of, we've done a lot of, you know, oh, that's tolerable. Like your, your, yours was honestly a pretty good review, but it got tolerable because it wasn't quite beefed, right? But then there's also your Overwatch tolerable, which was really not quite that good. Like your, it wasn't really on the same tier. There probably should be four tiers. I think that'd be the best way of doing it where there's a really good rank. That was good. That was eh. And that was not good, right? I think that's the most accurate way of doing things. Um, but the animations, I did the animations. Um, the problem is the animations with the OBS are kind of screwy. So um, I actually have a lot of experience with video editing and stuff like that. Baggins helps me out with some of it, but but yeah, I, I would like to see another tier, but it just depends on, it's just about getting the time to do it because it is a little tricky because I have to create a new tier, create the text for the tier. I, pro I don't even remember if I have the original files for the fonts I did, so it'd be a pain in the neck. It'd be like a whole afternoon. Uh, as Reaper Junkrat in May, how do I know when overextending versus being aggressive? Um, you need to know where your team is positioned. Because because here's the thing is overextension as heroes is real, but the vast majority of the times that you get punished for overextending is because you're overextending past where your team is positioned. And I know people are like, well, duh, that's the opposite. That's the definition of overextending. Well, what I mean is as in like your team is set up here, right? You can hard flank if the enemy team is like fighting your team, right? You can legit go like in backline May, you know, I don't recommend it or backline Jungrat, you know, or backline Reaper, right? But the problem that we see with overextension a lot is that your team is like here, right? And the enemy team is like way over here, they're not even fighting it, and then you go in on them there, right? You need to make sure that you're playing, attacking at the same time as your team is and looking like where is my team set up and setting up around that. Not on top of your team, but in an angle or a flank that's revolving around your team's kill box, like where the fight's gonna happen. Because a lot of times if you're overextending as Reaper, it's because you're flanking on the enemy team, but your team's like way over there. Like, hey, we can't help you, Reaper. What the heck are you doing? I hear Aquamarine's a pretty good junk, yeah. 
but I, I don't know. What's with the towel? I, I my hair got wet. It's a long story. Uh, how do I make sure? Okay, la, la, okay. No, screw you, Neapolitan. I've done too many questions. Screw you. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. My wig got wet. Yeah. See, wait, wait. Can I do this? My dad taught me how to do this. See, confirmed wig. See, it's a wig. Nobody has hair this luscious, and that's actually real. Ah. Uh, How do I go about, oh gosh, Neapolitan, you're a man child or a woman child or a thing child. How do I go about contesting a DPS plus mercy pocket? I feel like I'm just feeding the ultra charge, waste my time with them because most of the time they don't leave their position. I don't do any meaningful damage to them. If you're keeping them busy and they're not killing your team, it's a two for one trade. You're feeding them ult charge, but they're also feeding your ult charge. I'm not sure what hero that you're talking, oh, Diva. I mean, if you just, as long as you're not bleeding a lot of ult charge to them, you're fine. But the key thing is that you're also making sure that you're actually contesting them when they're actually contesting you. So when they're actively engaging and punishing your team in a team fight, that's when you contest them. Don't contest them before the fight starts or too early before the fight starts. Your job is just to kind of, you know, when they're actually scary, when the fight actually starts, that's when you're contesting them. Because yeah, you're feeding old charge, but you're keeping them from murdering your team. As long as you don't trade your mech for it, it's worth. How do you get your wig?